If you have a Bible, please turn to Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah chapter 23. As a little runway, if you want to turn back just a couple of chapters, we have been going through the book of Isaiah verse by verse, scripture by scripture, and we are in that portion of Isaiah where God now is, he's been calling the nation of Israel and Judah to return to him. His people have been far from him. And we hear from the beginning chapters of God's cry to his people. And so his people do not respond to his cry. And the other nations of the world are also, uh, you know, not responding to the word of God either. And so in these chapters, God is now beginning to pronounce judgment upon the nations. And it's amazing because Isaiah is writing of their past. He's writing of their present and he's also writing of things of the future. So when you read Isaiah, you are seeing a sometimes hundreds of years, thousands of years of time, and you're trying to take in the exact uh, period or moment that these different events are occurring. So as we come to uh, tonight in chapter 23, we're actually coming to Tyre. Um, and then in chapter 24, he actually looks all the way through to the end of the age to the judgment of the world. Actually, things that we see in the book of Revelation, we'll try to tie those uh, references together. Here he now gets into the burden against Tyre in verse 1. So Tyre was the chief city of the Phoenician Empire. The Phoenicians had the greatest navy of the ancient world. They were the commercial commerce mariner. And they had the greatest navy of their day. Um, I want to show you just a quick map so you can see uh, what this looked like. This is actually the area of Lebanon um, that is here. So if you look on this map, this area here is, um, there's Jerusalem. This is a reference point. This is Israel here. Um, Tyre and Sidon are right here. Cyprus, you're going to hear tonight also, is right here in this region. Uh, Tarsus is not listed here, but it's right here in this area as well. Um, this is Babylon, Assyria, Persia. This is modern-day Iran. This is modern-day Iraq, uh, this region here. Um, and then, you know, moving down through here is Egypt, Africa down here. And then uh, moving up, this area is Lebanon and Syria um, up in this area here. So, But we are focused specifically right here in Cyprus in this region here. So Tyre was literally a seaport inland, and they were known for their navy. Um, they were known for their uh, shipping and for, you know, bringing grain and merchandise uh, throughout that region. Um, they were affluent. They were idolatrous. Um, they were into uh, every type of immorality imaginable. Um, they were 100 miles north above Jerusalem, as you saw on the map. And they were also, they're an ancient city. They are recorded all the way back to the time of uh, Joshua. And so um, Tyre also has had some great, great moments uh, with the nation of Israel. And then like the nation of Israel also, they did not have such great moments in their history as well. So we'll look at that. So as we come to Isaiah 23, God is continuing to pronounce judgment upon the nations. And as we look at um, Tyre, Isaiah sees three different sieges upon Tyre. Um, one is by the Assyrian Empire. The next one will be by the Babylonians. Not much happens during the Medo-Persians, but then during the time of Alexander the Great, um, in the book of Ezekiel, it describes his siege will actually... Uh, go through what happened uh, during that siege. And it, it is uh, incredible. Tyre also had um, a good history and also a rough history. And they, their good history is during the time of King David. They had a tremendous relationship with King David and King Solomon. 
uh, under King Hiram of Tyre, who supplied the great timbers of the building materials for the temple. He actually, they actually used their ships to transport. Um, they also uh, utilized many of their sailors uh, that uh, they allowed Israel to use to build their commerce and also to help build the temple. And so they had some um, wonderful times there. But later, Tyre under King Sidon would give Israel one of the worst rulers in Israel's history, and her name was Jezebel. Jezebel came out of Tyre. Uh, so she became the wife of King Ahab of Israel, and Jezebel was the one who sought to destroy and kill Elijah. Uh, we know of the showdown with the 450 priests of Baal, and there was another 450 priests of Ashereth as well. And so that battle um, also came out of uh, Tyre. So Tyre was a walled city, only accessible from the sea. And so it was tough to destroy if you were trying to get at it inland because it was just a, a fortress. It was so difficult to destroy that after Assyria, Assyria came in, they uh, were able to somewhat conquer. And then uh, after that, they rebuilt. And then Nebuchadnezzar from Babylon, he sought to conquer Tyre. And he kind of got tired. It took him 12 years. He sieged Tyre for 12 years. Waiting out, trying from the naval, he was not successful. Trying from uh, military, was unsuccessful. He finally kind of wore down uh, Tyre. And what Tyre did when they were kind of getting tired, realizing that Nebuchadnezzar was not going to give up, they actually moved Tyre to an island that was one mile offshore. So they, while they're under siege, moved Tyre to an island that is one mile away, and that was easy for them to do with the naval that they had. And so it says when Nebuchadnezzar finally broke down and took over Tyre, um, it was pretty much empty at that point. They already had moved out and were on this island. Um, after the Medo-Persian Empire, so you have Babylon, the Medo-Persian Empire, and then you have Alexander the Great who comes on the scene. And Alexander the Great uh, was one of the fiercest world rulers. He wanted, he died very, very young, but he was unstoppable. And so he came to Tyre and he sent out uh, naval, his naval ships and was unable, he was unsuccessful to destroy Tyre. So as he was there on the shore, he noticed the old city of Tyre. And what he decided to do is he took all of the old building materials from Tyre and had his engineers throw them into the ocean and build a causeway or a road one mile. And this is archaeologically there. They've discovered he built a one-mile causeway from the shore of the old city of Tyre to the island of Tyre and went over and utterly destroyed and conquered Tyre. Alexander the Great. It's pretty incredible. In verse 1, he says, Well, you ships of Tarsus, because they were thought to be the unstoppable Navy, but Isaiah sees their destruction. So, wail you ships of Tarsus, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no harbor. From the land of Cyprus, it is revealed to them. And so, again, Cyprus was that big island that we saw that was there. And just to give you a geographical uh, standpoint. So, as ships were headed to Tyre, they generally stopped at Cyprus. And Cyprus gave word to those ships that were traveling to Tyre. Isaiah is letting them know that as those ships are going to Cyprus, preparing to go to Tyre, Cyprus is telling them that Tyre is no more. Be still, you inhabitants of the coastland, you merchants of Sidon, whom those who cross the sea have filled. So Sidon is, if you remember on the map, just north of Tyre. It was the sister a city to Tyre that is there. And verse 3, and on great waters, 
the grain of Shehor, the harvest of the river is her revenue, and she is a marketplace for the nation. So basically at this time, she is the national or international shipper of commerce that is there. Um, so Tyre's ships are there on the great waters of the Mediterranean. They were traveling up and down uh, throughout that region. They transported crops, goods, whatever needed to be shipped, timber, uh, metals, everything went. They were the major shipper and they could defend militarily on the water they, uh, pretty much against anyone. No one was able to really take them over um, on that territory. Um, they also, we find here, Shehor refers to the Nile Delta uh, from the very fertile valley of the Nile and that brought great revenue. There was great produce that was there. Um, Egypt, as you know, in their commerce and trade, uh, used Tiger for their shipping. And so, verse 4, Be ashamed, O Sidon, for the sea has spoken the strength of the sea, saying, I do not labor nor bring forth children, neither do I rear young men nor bring up virgins. So, uh, Sidon, we find here, again, the sister city of Tyre, and, and the Lord is saying here that they are going to cease to exist. There's no more young people that are there. They don't bring forth children. There's no more young men for battle, um, and that there's no more uh, virgins, those that are going to be married, which means that they're going to cease to exist. Verse 5, when the report reaches Egypt, they also will be in agony at the report of Tyre, Cross over to Tarsus, wail, you inhabitants of the coastland. So everyone was impacted by the destruction of Tyre, food supplies, commerce. Um, they're all reeling here now because now you basically had to, to go by uh, land transport, which was uh, camels, mules, horses, uh, by foot of people just carrying stuff now uh, became. And so this was uh, a major issue. Verse 7. Is this your joyous city whose antiquity is from ancient days, whose feet carried her far off to dwell? And so uh, Tyre can be tracked uh, or, or traced back uh, thousands and thousands of years. So they are, as the word of God says, an ancient day, an ancient city. They are again uh, there during the time of Joshua. Verse 8, who has taken this counsel against Tyre? the crowning city whose merchants are princes, whose traders are the honorable of the earth, which means that they were people of great status at the time. So who's, who has taken this counsel against Tyre? Who is against, basically, uh, Isaiah is saying, who's against Tyre? Because Tyre, people thought, is unstoppable. Verse 9, the Lord of hosts has purpose that the Lord is against Tyre. There's no nation that can stand or people or person that can stand against the Lord. And so when the Lord says and declares throughout the scriptures regarding a person, regarding a nation, regarding an event, it is going to happen. Um, and so again, all of this is written well before uh, these events take place. So who has taken this counsel against Tyre? Verse 9, the Lord of hosts has purposed it. Why? To bring to dishonor the pride. There's the problem of all glory to bring into contempt all the honorable of the earth. So the problem here, and often you'll find throughout the scriptures, whether it was Babylon, uh, whether it's the Assyrian Empire, whether it is Satan at his fall, the major sin that God judges is the sin of pride. And pride always comes before the fall. And so here we find that God would use this siege of tires upon tires, a nation, their people, their fortunes, to show how the sin of pride, the self-made man, who was trusting in his pagan gods, how futile it was. And what's amazing is that God gave them many years. You think of Nebuchadnezzar, who's besieging Tyre for 12 years. There's 12 years to turn to the Lord. And instead of turning to the Lord, they're trying to, it's almost like our planet, trying to save themselves. We're going to move to another uh, island, another place. Um, it reminds me of the physicist Stephen uh, Hawking before he died, um, who says the only way that we can be saved is if we uh, build something on the moon and go to the moon and set up another uh, civilization. We need to change places because this world is doomed, um, is what he had said. So uh, here we find that the people of Tyre, instead of turning to the Lord, who has the greatest salvation plan ever, 
uh, we have a, a tremendous exit strategy. Instead of turning to the Lord, they turn to their own resources. And that should be a big, you know, a, a really stick in our minds because when we're faced with so many trials, and I don't know what you're going through, but whatever you're going through tonight, it can be a family issue, it could be a financial, it could be work, it could be health, it could be a giant that is there. <laughs> And we try to do everything within our power. I love what Pastor Chuck says. We do our best, but the most important thing is to commit the rest. Is that we do need to go to the Lord with whatever issue first. And at the beginning, we do what we can in the natural. But we have to go to the Lord because the Lord is the only one who can deliver us. He's the only one who can save us. He's the only one who can bless us. Um, so... That's the place to turn. And unfortunately, what we learned from this is they began to seek even the pagan gods, the foolish things of this world that could not help them. Also know this concerning as we're looking at God's judgment. There will always come a time where God will interrupt human history and show who the real king of kings is. And I have to tell you that in watching the news and watching our elections, and in watching all of the political things that are happening, uh, the new talks of COVID and vaccines and who's not vaccinated and all the stuff that's coming out right now, to see what's going on in Russia and Iran and Israel, uh, to see what is going on in the United States of America. When you begin to look at all of these things and these events and of everyone trying to gain power, all of the corruption that is out there, all of the control, you must remember, and because you'll lose your mind, you must remember in these days to trust in the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, period. This is his word. This is where his promises are. This is where our future and our hope is at. And this is how we get through. This is how we win these battles that we're facing. And so, so important for us to, that, you know, ultimately God is going to deal with everything that we're seeing. He tells us, you know, uh, how it's going to happen, what he's going to do, what he's going to do for the church, for you, his people. Everything is written out. The only thing he asks you to do is walk with him. Trust him. Be ready for him. Even though you see the world going to hell in a handbasket, which it is, walk with him and encourage other people you know, turn other people to the Lord. It's the greatest thing you can do right now because if they trust in the things of this world, they're going to fall with the things of this world. Verse 10, overflow through your land like the river, O daughter of Tarsus, there is no more strength. And so, uh, you know, Tarsus who is trusting in the economy of Tyre, there's no more strength. He stretched out his hand over the sea. He shook the kingdoms. The Lord has given a commandment against Canaan to destroy its strongholds. This prophecy is given again. Uh, Canaan refers to that area of Assyria, of Babylon, of those regions that, are, uh, that God is going to use to bring judgment upon uh, Tyre. And what's interesting, too, is that, you know, Assyria may think that they're in control in Babylon. But the, the scriptures tell us that the, the heart of the king is in the hands of the Lord. And like the rivers, he steers them. God is in control. When we even look at prophecy now in Ezekiel 38 of the nations that God says, these nations are going to be aligned specifically. Here's Israel, here's Russia, here's Iran, here's Turkey. Here's the other surrounding areas. Who, here's who's going to be involved. Saudi Arabia, he tells you the dividing lines. He tells you who's going to be with who. And for the first time ever in world history, this alignment is right now. We're watching it. We're witnessing it. And there's no secrets. God is telling us, hey, this is exactly how it's going to go down. And he also tells you, the church, hey, be ready. Be about my business. Be faithful. Be sharing the gospel with people in these days because people need help and they need hope. And right now people are turning to drugs and alcohol. And just like the Bible says, the days of Noah, to the party scene, we're even going to see this mentioned here tonight, that people will be turning to all these different things, trying to find comfort and peace. And there's no comfort and peace in those things. There's no hope or help. Your only hope and help will be in the Lord because he is the Prince of Peace. He is the mighty God. He is the Holy One and he's the one who loves you more than you'll ever know. Verse 12, and he said, you will rejoice no more. O you oppressed virgin daughter of Sidon, 
arise, cross over to Cyprus. There also you will have no rest. So we find here that they, uh, in escaping from Tyre, they went to Cyprus, that island that we looked at, and even there they could not escape the pursuit of their enemy. So um, when the Bible speaks of world empires, they literally went in and took over everybody and everything. Um, and you know what's amazing? You look at the men and women of God, you look at Daniel, who lived in and probably went in, in, you know, during the, the time of Nebuchadnezzar in his kingdom and how God protected him. You know, his friends, they are thrown into the fire. He's thrown into a lion's den and all of the threats, and he outlived all of them because God was covering him in and through that, those situations. And so the most important thing for us is regardless of what happens, be walking with the king because all of our times, we have an expiration date. Does everybody know that? And God knows what it is. When you get a cereal box and you see it expires August 24th, 2025, or if you have a Twinkie, it's 2030, I'm sure, okay? Because of all the preservatives. So you have an expiration time where God says, okay, and, and the blessing for you is you don't expire. You go to be with the Lord forever and ever. You'll never be better, never be more beautiful where you're going. And you'll be with the Lord and with God's people forever and ever. And so we don't fear death. We don't worry about death um, because Jesus has paid the ultimate price for us that we can have life, he says, and life abundantly. So live your life now for the Lord. You only get to do this once. You don't get time back. But God promises you all time. And so live now for the Lord. Take advantage of the time that we have. Don't run to the other places, to the Cypresses. Don't run to the other cities, to the other islands. You know, I just came from Hawaii, from Maui, from that literal area that just burned. And while I was there, I said, wow, this is like the most beautiful place I've been to on the earth. How amazing it is. Um, and my wife and I had talked, and we said, could we actually live here? That was one of the questions. And we were like, yeah, we could live here. And then I wouldn't go because of the ministry of serving the Lord, but... It was a thought of because you feel so removed there. And then within weeks, that city that we were in was completely burned down. The tree that was there, the bunion tree that was there, we took pictures, numbers of them, was burned. The area, because there's no place, you know, that uh, this world is temporal. And when the Lord comes, it will be forever and ever. And so we look forward to that time. People were getting close. Verse 13, behold, the land of the Chaldeans, the people which was not Assyria founded it for wild beasts of the desert. They set up its towers. They raised up its palaces and brought it to ruin. Um, again, this is again speaking of the uh, judgment. Uh, Whale, verse 14, you ships of Tarsus, for uh, your strength is laid waste. Now it shall come to pass uh, in that day that Tyre will be forgotten for 70 years according to the days of one king. So we find here that Tyre will be forgotten for a period of 70 years. Uh, and this is again, this is uh, future. Isaiah is telling them that they're going to be judged. 70 years will go. The number 70 in the scriptures is a number of culmination. It's also a number of, uh, you know, Jesus, you know, when Peter was speaking about forgiveness. You know, Peter said, Lord, if I forgive my brother seven times, is that okay? And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven, which equals 490, right? So we also find the 70th week of Daniel, right? 70 times seven, 490 years that is there till it's fulfilled. And so it's a number of culmination of, of kind of a coming to a fulfillment or completion of. And at the end of seven years, it will happen to Tyre is in the song of the harlot. And so this, I'll explain to you what this means. Verse 16. So the harlot was the one who took up a harp. She went about the city. Uh, you forgotten harlot, make sweet melodies, sing many songs that you may be remembered. So the song here speaks of the, when the prostitutes would go out into the streets to uh, attract men that were there, they would often sing. Some of them would play an instrument trying to attract attention to uh, themselves in order to get back customers and business. And so the singing of songs, as he's speaking here, that 
Tyre will revive. And so he's saying that you're going to go back to your old ways, to being the harlot here speaks of spiritual adultery, that you're going to be looking for love in all of the wrong places in your life. You're going to go back to your old ways is what he's telling them. You're going to be singing the songs of the world. You're going to be doing the things of the world. And it shall be at the end of 70 years that the Lord will deal with Tyre. She will return to hire and commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. You would have thought after 70 years that they would have turned to the Lord. But instead, they return back to the world. You know, and I think there's a, a, a very important message for us because how many people today that God delivers and restores from the hands of the enemy only to return back to the world when they had the opportunity and yet they're still seeking to be in the world, going back to the old ways, the old habits, the old places. And so this here he's saying, you know what? You're going back to the same old music. You're going back to the same old songs. You're going back to your same old ways. In verse 18, he says, uh, here again, uh, her gain and her pay will be set apart for the Lord. He's now seeing the future where Tyre will actually turn to the Lord. It will not be treasure nor laid up for her gain, but will be for those who dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for fine clothing. Some, there's a dual, some, there's two major uh, thoughts on this particular uh, verse here. Some see this verse's fulfillment during the time of the early church in the book of Acts chapter 21, where Paul is in Tyre. There's a group of believers that are there, um, a strong, in a sense, church that is there in that region of Tyre. Um, other people see this as the return of the Lord during the millennial reign where they will be used to uh, minister to, you know, the men and women, the people of God during that time. So um, either one uh, is we know that they, there was a church established there. It can be future as well. Um, that is here. Again, when you read Isaiah, Isaiah is seeing this, you know. Um, when you read the book of Revelation, he, John is seeing this. You know, an incredible amount of time and writing down in a few verses under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit of what he's seeing. Um, and so this is, this is what he's seeing. We now go to Isaiah chapter 24. Isaiah 24 is pretty heavy. This now looks to the end of the world, specifically. This chapter is also known as um, Isaiah's vision of the apocalypse. And this is speaking now, not only has he seen the judgment of nations, he is now looking at the judgment of the world. This is future people. This is what is yet to come. Many of the scriptures here link to other scriptures in the Old Testament and clearly to the book of Revelation. And we will touch on some of them as we go through this. As we think about the end times and we think about the last days that are here, I wanted to quickly run through some of the updates from our last prophecy update. So what are things that we know that tell us we're in the end times? The first thing is, is that Israel, the Jewish people must be back in the land. So May 14th, 1948, the Jews are back in. Jerusalem must be reestablished because if they're going to have a third temple, they must have Jerusalem, right? And so the, the Jerusalem is uh, established I wanted to just run through some of these. If you read Matthew 24, Luke chapter 21, um, the book of Revelation, Daniel chapter 9. And I know I'm, I'm you know, going through a lot of scriptures right now, but these all speak about the days. And I just want to show you these because we weren't able to show you these in our last update. Just to show you where we are, not that I say or the, the, what God's word says, that today's news is aligning with scripture. So... Lord, we pray this will work because we've had so much trouble even showing this. So um, go to, um, let's go to number two. Okay, so there's a, there is a, is this the last update we did? 
from the very last one? Okay. So this is the One, Re Re uh, one World Religion headquarters. We know that there will be a One World Religion um, that will be established, and uh, we find that the coming world leader known as the Antichrist will be the one who will unite Israel and Islam, uh, the mosque next to the temple that is there, and they have built, it's already open um, in the Middle East, it's called the Abrahamic Family House. It is finished already. It's in Abu Dhabi. And that campus right now that you can go and visit has a Catholic church, a mosque, and a synagogue all on one campus. And it is forwarding one world religion when you're here. Okay, let's go to the next one. Let me see what the next one is before we go there. Um, do we have the one on the third temple that has the cattle on it? That was one of them. Okay, so we'll go to, um, let's go to Tel Aviv Pride. So in Israel right now, it'll be like the days of Lot. Israel has one of the largest uh, LGBTQ marches in all of the world. Um, and this is the uh, one in Tel Aviv. You can go to Jerusalem next. And let me tell you, when you look at the footage, the people are lined up as far as you can see. All right, so let's back out of there. Go down to Jerusalem. There you go. Thousands march in Jerusalem Pride's parade. First under Israel's most right-wing government ever. Just to show you, right-wing means conservative, religious government ever. Next. Central Bank. This was interesting. We couldn't show you this last time. Let's see where we get this time. All right. So this is the map for uh, the Central Bank. If you want to look at this, you just have to go to our mobile app. Go to Prophecy Update for Sunday. Click on Sources. It's all there. This is exactly where we're pulling this from. All right. So this is the, this is the current digital bank, which means that we are headed for a one-world currency. Okay? This map shows you right now those that are in blue are the United States, Europe, and those allied with the United States, which are under blue is called development. So you have 32 that are there under development. Green is pretty much the communist Shiite uh, countries that are aligned. So you have uh, there, you have Russia, China, India, uh, North Korea, Australia um, that are aligned. The green means that they are one step from launching a digital currency, which means no more cash, no more coins. They're one step from launch. So they're already done with their, you know, they're in this sense, they're already done with their, uh, they're in the pilot program, which means that it's being tested in specific areas right now. Once they launch digital currency, only those countries will be able to do business. And in order for you to do business, you will have to purchase their currency, their digital currency, to do business with them. It means it will be the end of the U.S. dollar. They're one step um, from launch. So you see where Russia, China, where that alignment is. The United States is two steps. We are in the development stage right now. You can also, we don't have, yeah, you can click on that, Austin. Shows you what will be um, under the digital currency. So development, retail, wholesale, all, all of your shopping, um, intermediated, and when you click on those links of those countries, it tells you exactly what you will be able to buy and sell and do business with that is there. They will have full control over uh, your finances. So you will not be able to buy or sell unless you're in the digital market. Um, that's why you see such movements today in Bitcoin and digital currencies and, uh, because people are anticipating when this is going to come. I don't know when it's coming, but I can tell you that we're getting close. Um, I will not be surprised if we see it launched within the next five years. So not making a prophecy, but if looking at it right now of how quickly we're moving, um, it could be that soon. Okay, let's go to the next one. And what will ultimately happen to that map, that map will ultimately become, we won't be here for that, we'll all become one color. It will become a one world currency. That's where it's all headed. And there'll be one who will... Uh, put that system in. Amazon, I don't want to run the video, just click on it really quick. Amazon, one palm payment technology is coming to all 500 
plus Whole Foods markets and stores. Walmart is working on it right now. Um, Target, all your major stores. And if you uh, scan up, go ahead, keep going. Oh, the other way. Yep, right there. So there's two things that are there. They are going to have your palm print with a chip that is in your card right now. Both of those are used. Your palm is registered. And where I, this is probably heading is to some type of mark that allows you to scan that actually identifies that as you. So right now it's a two-step process. It'll be headed to a one-step. And so, um, but this is going to be live this year. So you just walk in, chip and card, chip and palm, and then from there you can walk in, buy whatever you want. You swipe your palm, and it pays for everything um, in your in your basket. It eliminates shoplifting. So if you think you're stealing everything in the store and getting out, you're not getting out anymore. So. Um, so now it's, it's uh, okay, let me go to the next one. What else do we want to show you from here? Um, UAPs will skip. Biologics will skip. Um, AI is growing. AI is artificial intelligence. Just open it, but don't go into it. So AI right now, this describes to you, in order for a one world leader to control everyone, artificial intelligence. It's on your phones. Are you aware of that? It's all artificial intelligence. It's a low level. You get into a car that drives itself, it is high level. It doesn't need you to make a decision. So AI right now is functioning many of the systems in our world right now and is being tested because it's the only way that you can organize that many people and keep track. Um, and we can go to the next one. Um, yeah, go to the last one. I know this is going to disturb you. How many of you realize you've been hearing all over the place, COVID, 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 everybody's getting COVID? So um, this, was a, this was a couple of weeks ago, um, July 31st, a Chinese lab in California, in Fresno, experimenting with hundreds of mice with COVID and all other types of diseases. People were watching the mice go out from under the doors of this Chinese lab, and who knows how many labs there are. If you didn't, if someone didn't tell me about this, it's not, and this is USA Today, supposedly a credible paper, but if someone didn't tell me to actually go look for this, it wasn't broadcast anywhere or told anywhere. Nobody was arrested. Nobody was taken into custody. They got in there. They found 180 dead mice from COVID. Who knows what was released or how many were released, how many labs there are throughout the country. Um, and so nothing, it, it's, look this up for yourself. I mean, it's just, but it's amazing. And so now they're saying, uh, you know, going back to the COVID rules, et cetera. So uh, this is going to be one of the things they're going to use to control um, between the WHO and the United Nations. So, all right, let's go back to Isaiah 24. You can turn the lights back on. Thank you. Isaiah 24. Isaiah now looks to the end. The other thing you need to know in Daniel chapter 9 is there's 490 years. We have our Daniel, the whole book of Daniel posted online. I don't have time to go through all of this tonight, but I would encourage you to listen to Daniel chapter 9. It will take you through the understanding of this prophecy. 490 years are in that prophecy. 483 years are fulfilled to the day up until the time of Christ. When Jesus goes to the cross, the time of the cross, the Messiah is cut off, the time clock stops, and there's seven years remaining. Those remaining seven years is known as the tribulation period. Everybody follow me? It's the final seven years the Bible speaks about. It's known as the 70th week of Daniel. It completes the 490 years. The middle of that week of the seven years is a three and a half year mark. It's known as the Great Tribulation. At that time, the temple is rebuilt. At that time, the Antichrist is ruling the world. At that time, the church is gone. So we can just read about it. But during that time, at the three and a half year mark, it's called the Abomination of Desolation when the Antichrist goes into the temple and declares himself to be God and to be worshiped. The other article I wanted to show you, which I don't know if Austin can find, is the Jews right now are preparing to build that third temple. They actually have the red heifers, these perfect red cows, 
that were, are within one year of being qualified and they have five that are candidates right now that can be used for the temple sacrifice. So, so it's close, you know, things are moving along. Plus you have the whole Ezekiel 38 war assembly. Scriptures for you to read, Daniel 9, Matthew 24, Luke 21, the book of Revelation, we'll look at a little bit tonight. Isaiah 24 here sees the end of the world. He sees what will happen to the earth. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. It makes it waste, distorts its surface, and scatters abroad its inhabitants. He sees here the end of the earth. And again, this, is a, this happens at the end of the uh, tribulation period is what he is in a sense seeing at the end of God's judgments. During this time, the church is gone before the final seven year period. That's why it's important for you to know Christ in your life. This is now those who've gone through that tribulation period, that seven year period, which will be the majority of the nation of Israel, especially when you see what Israel's doing, they're falling hook, line, and sinker for the whole world system. And those who've rejected Christ, who says, I don't want Jesus, we're pride, rainbow, whatever you're doing. We're against the Lord. We want what we want. They're going to go through, whoever, whoever rejects Christ is going to go through that tribulation, that seven-year period. It is horrific. The Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. The one thing you need to know is salvation is always available now and through the tribulation period. Just like it was available to Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, all of the nations that we've read about, salvation was always available. The prophets were always crying out. The opportunity for them to know God was there. Just like Ruth, who was a Moabitess, it was there, the opportunity for her. When you go through the scriptures and you see the men and women that turn to the Lord, salvation's available. It's always available. But this is those who have rejected, rejected, and are following the enemy. And it shall be, I wanted to read Matthew 24, 15. It speaks there about the abomination of desolation. This is what leads to this final judgment. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, that's Daniel chapter 9, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. This is again the Antichrist in the temple declaring himself to be God last three and a half years. That's a great tribulation. Jesus says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop, we actually looked at that, not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, nor has ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, notice this, unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened, which means Jesus will be coming for his people. And this is those that are going through, specifically the nation of Israel, anyone who receives him during that tribulation period, unless those days were shortened. Isaiah is seeing here in verse 1, Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty and makes it waste, distorts its surface and scatters abroad its inhabitants. When you read Revelation of what's coming, Verse 2, and it shall be as with the people, as so as the, with the priest, as with the servant, so with his master, and so with the maid, so with his, uh, her mistress, and with the buyer, with the seller, the lender, the borrower, the creditor, so with the debtor, the land shall be entirely emptied and utterly punished, for the Lord has spoken this word. He's saying here that everyone will be impacted. It doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It doesn't matter if you're the borrower or you're the lender. It doesn't matter if you are the owner or the uh, worker, it's going, everybody will be on the same playing field during the judgment of God. He's not a respecter of persons. Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 9, specifically chapter 9, 
tells us that more than one third of humanity will die in the judgments of during the great tribulation. Great, great cataclysmic events, plagues, demonic activities uh, de being released. Um, and so it, incredible uh, judgment upon humanity. There are those Christians today who are planning to go through the great tribulation. Okay. They are storing up food for seven years. They are gathering arms to protect their houses. They have, some of them have purchased homes in uh, lands where there's, uh, are undeveloped. And they are, you know, not only are there some Christians, there's also just people out there that believe in the end times that are not Christians that are also doing these things too. You see the, these companies out there. How many of you have seen like the Patriots where you can buy food and they'll send you this uh, food that is vacuum packed that'll stay uh, for days and stuff. It's not to say that won't get you through a shortage, but seven years is a long time, right? So they're also planning to be able to live off the land. They can't be tracked. They're changing citizenship and they're doing all of these different things. Based on the scriptures, I do not believe the church will be here during the wrath of God. It doesn't mean that things are not going to get hard for us up until the church is taken out. I don't know how hard it's going to get, but I do know it, it can get pretty rough. The Bible doesn't hide that from us. Just because we're a Christian doesn't exempt us from suffering or hardship or trials because God will still use us to be a witness in a perishing world. Just like the days of Noah. Noah was a witness all the way until the time he got on the ark. And so was Lot. Judgment was literally right at hand and the world was a horrible, Sodom and Gomorrah was a horrible place. It was pretty bad. And just before judgment, in both of those cases, except for Enoch, Enoch was taken out um, a lot earlier. But in those cases, God removed his people before judgment. So things can get pretty crazy for the church. And you'll really see who is the church because you're going to see a lot of churches compromising like we did through COVID and other things that are just giving into the world system, you know, or just. But I do believe the church will be taken out. Second Thessalonians, Matthew 24, he's, Jesus even tells us the two will be in the field. One will be working, one will be taken. Um, Revelation chapter 3, Luke 21, the concluding prayer of the Lord. Um, watch therefore and pray always that it may be counted worthy to escape all of these things that are yet to come and to stand before the Son of Man. Enoch, Lot, um, being removed before judgment. And so God has not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. The book of Revelation deals with the wrath of God, the judgment of God. We're not appointed for that. Verse four, what happens to, he tells us what happens to the people. Verse four, the earth mourns and fades away. The world languishes and fades away. The haughty people of the earth. This is pride again. Haughty is proudful. Haughty people of the earth languish. The earth is also defiled under its inhabitants. Look what we're doing to this world. It's incredible. When you see what's happening to our world today, the heart of humanity, the movies that are coming out now of trafficking and things being exposed, the political battles between good and evil, what's going on in so many countries, so why will God judge? Notice this. You should underline this, verse 5. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. Three things. God says he's bringing judgment. This is what Isaiah sees. Because number one, they have broken the law of God. It means that they are living a life of defiance to what God says is righteous. The second thing is, is they change the ordinance. Means that they are calling evil good in good evil. They are redefining the word of God. They are changing the ordinance. The Bible says this, but we say this, and this is what we're following. So we're okay with abortions. We're okay with LGBTQ. We're okay with redefining family. We're okay with drug use. We're okay with alcoholism. We're okay with 
the, like the days of Noah, like the days of Lot. Do what is right in your own eyes. That's the law. We're redefining the ordinance. And the third thing is they broke the everlasting covenant. That means it's the ultimate rejection of Christ. That is breaking the uh, everlasting covenant. Jesus is the first and the last. Your rejection of him is breaking the everlasting covenant. There's no other way for people to be saved. And there comes a point where the cup of God's wrath of indignation is full, a point where the line of grace has is, is been stepped over. And it doesn't matter who you are. You can, a person can go one step too many times and it's over. We can. So, so never take advantage of the grace of God and the mercy of God in your life. Always appreciate the grace and mercy of God. If you've messed up in your life, turn to the Lord like David did. He returned to the Lord. He said, Lord, I messed up. I blew a, read Psalm 51. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. Um, you know, change my heart. He asked for his heart to be cleansed in his life. It's a prayer of repentance. If you've messed up in your life, which is going to happen, return to the Lord. He's waiting for you. Don't take advantage of the grace and mercy of God. It's a blessing for your life. But realize that God is going to interrupt human history at some point. Well, I believe we'll be gone, but he will. Therefore, the curse has devoured the earth and those who dwell in it are desolate. Therefore, which means there's nothing left. Therefore, the inhabitants of the earth are burned and few men are left. So the first judgment was by water. The next judgment will be by fire. Isn't it interesting that there are fires starting all over the place? United States, Canada, Hawaii, British Columbia, Israel, different spot, uh, the Middle East. You go throughout the world and you see fires. They're man-made starting. And even when you watch the satellite maps, like in, Cal in Canada, they all started at the same time from all these different locations. People are questioning what happened in Maui because none of the alarms went off. None of the people were notified. No emergency services happened. No cell phones are working. How can all of those things not be working in the United States of America? How? I was there. I saw the sirens. We had perfect cell, uh, cell service down there. How, how is it that all of those systems are not working, and, and I was in that city, that they're not working? I'm not going to... Uh, Anyways, verse 7, the new wine fails, the vine languishes, all the merry-hearted sigh, these are the partiers, the mirth of the tambourine ceases, the noise of the jubilant ends, the joy of the harp ceases, they shall not drink wine with a song, strong drink is bitter to those who drink it. It means the party's over. Jesus says, just like the days of Noah, they're going to be partying. Just like the days of Lot, they're going to be partying. And Isaiah sees here that things are so bad, the parties, no, people don't even want to party anymore. Alcohol and whatever drugs and things are out there are not going to do it in that time. The city of confusion is broken down, which means the world is done. This world right now is confused and lost. Every house is shut up so no one may go in. Isn't that interesting? Everybody is hiding in their houses. Think about the last two years, people hiding in their houses. There is a cry for wine in the streets. All joy is darkened. The mirth of the land is gone and the city of desolation is left and the gate is stricken with destruction. It speaks here basically the system is broken down. People now, instead of turning to the Lord, are hiding in their houses and they're trying to. And you think of, you know, people, you know, just, just during COVID, um, I do deliveries. And how many houses you go to, people are hiding in the houses and worrying masks and all types of things in fear, the media driven, and uh, it's crazy. Not, and it's speaking that, again, this will be far greater during the tribulation period. Verse 13, when it shall be thus in the midst of the land among the people, it shall be like the shaking of an olive tree, like the gleaning of grapes when the vintage is gone. It means that the world is going to be so shaken that there's going to be very li little fruit left. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Therefore glorify the Lord in the dawning light, the name of the Lord God of Israel and the coastlands of the sea. From the ends of the earth, we have heard songs. Glory to the righteous. 
But I said, I am ruined and ruined. Woe to me. The treacherous dealers have dealt treacherously. Indeed, the treacherous dealers have dealt very treacherously. So even in the midst of great judgment, God has his people here, which you see in these verses, that are praising him. They're going to be those that turn to him. And so before the great tribulation, God will remove his people, but many will come to trust in Jesus, I believe, and the scripture tells us during the tribulation period. When the church is gone, I'm going to tell you, there are people that came to this church and thousands of other churches that heard the gospel, that heard the whole presentation, that understood everything and came every week, but because they still wanted to have one foot in, one foot out, said, when I see it, I'll believe it. So when the church is gone and they come to church and we're not here, they're going to turn to the Lord at that point. Many will and say, what must I do to be saved? And the world is trying incredible deception today. That's why I speak to people, even if they think you're crazy, speak, share the gospel and share about the rapture also, about salvation. So here there are those that are praising the Lord. They are crying out to God, even in the midst of the judgments. And it's going to be, let me tell you, to come to faith during the great tribulation will cost you your life. That's what the scripture says. You either will have to survive on your own, um, but if you take the mark of the beast, which means you belong to Satan, you will be eternally damned. And so um, it's better for you to live for Christ now because it'll be very hard to die for him later. Verse 17, fear and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitants of the earth. There are three things you need to know here. Um, fear, people don't want to go to hell, and the pit and the snare are upon you, O inhabitant of the earth. It means that hell is close. The end is close. There are three things. Hades, Sheol, hell, the grave are one place. That's the same word that describes. So people get these all confused. Hades, Sheol, hell, and the grave is one place. It is in the center of the earth. It is the place of the incarceration of the dead until the coming of Christ. In Luke chapter 16, so in the heart of the earth right now is where hell is, the grave, what we're describing here. In Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells us that Lazarus and the rich man, this is before Jesus. So the rich man represents the one who died without God. He went into the heart of the earth to hell, to a place of torment, described himself burning. If I could touch uh, a drop of water on my tongue, there is no purgatory. Jesus says no one can pass over from here to there or from there to here. There's no purgatory. He says it himself. You cannot pray anyone out of hell. Your decision is now. That's why the gospel is critical. Also there, prior to Christ, was a place of paradise. That's where uh, the poor man went. That's where Lazarus went. So Lazarus went to a place of paradise. It was called Abraham's bosom. So before Jesus, when those in the, people always ask this, where did, the, where did those in the Old Testament go? They went to a place of paradise. So hell, Sheol had two compartments. The first compartment was a place of torment, awaiting judgment, a place of incarceration, torment, and the other place was a place of paradise. So when Jesus went to the cross and then he uh, passed on the cross, he went down into the heart of the earth. Remember what he says? It's just as Jonah went down into the center of the well, he went down into the heart of the earth. When he went down into the heart of the earth, two things happened. He preached to those who were waiting for him there in that compartment that was there of paradise, that it's fulfilled. And then the scripture says he led captivity free. They went with him. The Bible tells us also, and I think we're recovering the gospel of Matthew, that um, when Jesus resurrected, when he came out, there were those that were seen visibly walking the streets of Jerusalem. The resurrection had happened, which means that they went to be with the Lord. He also preached victory to the spirits that were there. Totally false teaching that he went and suffered in hell. That's from the pit of hell, period. No such thing as the Bible teach whatsoever. He then from there ascended. And those, the, the scripture says in Ephesians 4, that he who, uh, before he ascended, he descended into the lowest parts, preached to those, led captivity free, 
and that he ascended there, uh, which we see in the book of Acts. And so he led captivity uh, free. So that place of paradise in the center of the earth is out of business. It is closed. Jesus has led. And now they are in glory with the Lord. So you see Stephen, for example, when he's being stoned to death, he sees Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. Paul the Apostle says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And so now when you perish, you go to be, when you breathe your last here, you go to be with the Lord. Those who die without Christ, just like the rich man, go into the center of the earth to hell. And they wait there and they are in torment there. And that's nothing compared to what's coming. The second thing is the pit or the abuso, where the grave and hell are the place of man's incarceration. The pit is the place of demonic fallen angel incarceration. Okay, that's called the abuso or the bottomless pit. It's a shaft that goes from earth, the Bible says, all the way down somewhere into the center of the earth. So there's a shaft that we don't see it, but that is there. Um, in Revelation, it speaks during the judgments, during that seven-year tribulation, that the bottomless pit is opened and all these demons are released to torment humanity during that seven-year period. Released in, in myriads. It's also the place that Satan is sent during the millennial reign of Christ. He's sent to the abuso, to the bottomless pit, and is locked up and is chained up there. And there are also other demons that are chained up right now um, in that pit, awaiting the time where they'll be released during the Great Tribulation period. And so, um, and then the third thing is the Lake of Fire or Gehenna. And that's the place where it all ends. That's the second death. And that's where there's the great white throne judgment. And then all those judged, Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophets, all those who have rejected, Hades itself, the Bible says, is then cast into Gehenna, into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever. And that is the ultimate place of God's punishment for the unrighteous, for all of them. And so, verse 18, it shall be that he who flees from the noise of the fear shall fall into the pit, which means that if you're going to, you know, follow the world system and be afraid of the world system, it's headed for a dead end. And he who comes up from the midst of the pit shall be caught in the snare for the windows from uh, on high are open and the foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. He is seeing all of this. The earth reels to and fro like a drunkard. This is a very popular scripture. This is exactly where it is found. And it shall totter like a hut. And so its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will uh, fall and not rise again. And so he is seeing here um, the end of the end. Second Peter chapter three, verses 10 through 13 um, tells us there that uh, Peter sees that the earth is there consumed by a fervent heat. Um, he sees literally the melting away of the earth and he encourages us to be walking with the Lord. And verse 21, as we close, and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish um, on high the host of the exalted ones. These are believed to be the demonic, uh, these fallen angels. And on the earth, the kings of the earth, they will be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and will be shut up in prison. After many days, they will be punished. So we find here that this is the uh, coming to the judgment where all of, in a sense, the great white throne judgment, but it could be the gathering or the waiting period before the great white throne judgment where they are gathered for judgment um, before the Lord. So he sees this gathering, the emptying, preparing for uh, the judgment. And so the same judgment will fall on the kings and all of the other entities uh, that were there. Verse 23, the moon shall be disgraced and the sun shamed. Matthew 24, verse 29, tells us after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven. The powers of heaven will be shaken. And the last verse, for the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion. That is Jerusalem. That is why Jerusalem is the most battled and fought upon place on all of the earth because it is the very place that Jesus returns and rules and reigns from. So Jerusalem is always going to be a cup of trembling on this planet. It doesn't belong to anyone except 
to the Lord. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, in case you're wondering where it is, and before his elders gloriously. Zechariah 14 uh, tells us, if you want to turn to Zechariah, we'll look at it real quick. It's a series of scriptures here I want to walk you through. Um, so Zechariah 14 speaks of the day of the Lord when the Lord returns. We don't have time to uh, read it. Turn to Revelation. After that, Revelation chapter 19 in your Bible. I just want you to see that the headings for this because then you can read this later. But um, we find here in Revelation chapter 19, verse 11, Christ on a white horse. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true. His eyes were like a flame of fire, his head with many crowns. Um, and then we find here the armies of heaven are clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Out of his mouth goes a sharp two-edged sword. Um, and we find here he himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Jesus is right now Savior, but he's coming as judge. And his name, this is so cool, written on his, uh, he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. How cool is that? Um, you will be able to identify him. He has a personal name tag that is on him. And then we find in verse 17 through 21, the beast and his armies defeated. That occurs in Armageddon when it's game over. Chapter, Revelation chapter 20, Satan is bound for a thousand years. That is the millennial reign of Christ for the thousand year period. Revelation 20 verse 4 is uh, the saints reign with Christ for a thousand years. That is us. And then Satan is released from the pit in Revelation 27 and his rebellion is crushed. He's allowed to go out and deceive the world again. Why? Because during that time, man will repopulate, not us who are already, uh, you know, in our, our final bodies, but the world is repopulated and God will allow them to make that decision also um, as well. Then we have the great white throne judgment. Anybody whose name is not found in the Lamb's book of life, this is when all the world, will, uh, hell, everything. Look at verse um, 12. And I saw the dead, small, and great standing before God. Books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to their works. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them, and they were judged, each one according to his works. Then death and Hades were cast into Gehenna, the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone's name, anyone not found in the, written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. Zechariah 12.10. This is when the Jews in Jerusalem see Jesus who is there, that he will pour it on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me whom they have pierced. So after this battle has happened, um, the nation of Israel then, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, uh, come to Jesus. We got to continue to proclaim the message, you know, but they're going to go through it. And then Revelation 21, verses 1 through 8. This is our last reading. Revelation 21. So what happens to this earth? This earth is going to be gone at some point, but there will be a new one and you'll be on it. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea. Then I saw John, this is after the uh, millennial reign of Christ. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride adorned for her. I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. This is the fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. With men he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. What will heaven be like? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. Then he who sat on it, the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of water of life freely to him who thirsts. 
He who overcomes shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my sons and daughters. Notice verse 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, you can write drug users. It is the name pharmakia. Idolaters and all liars will have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Father, we thank you for your word and pretty heavy chapter, Lord, looking at the end times, things yet to come. And we are very thankful this evening that we have heaven ahead of us. And we pray, Father, in these days, continue to lead us and guide us by your spirit. I pray for anyone here, anybody watching online, if you don't know Jesus in your life and you're saying, you know what, I need to give my heart to Christ it's the best and most important decision of your life. I just want to ask you to pray with me right now. And you're just asking Jesus to come into your heart, to be your Lord, to be your Savior, to forgive you of all your sins. And I'm going to tell you, God will do a work in your life from the inside out. He'll help you in the areas you can't help yourself. And he'll give you eternal life. And the beautiful thing is that your name will be written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if you want that for your life, just pray with me right now. Father, we come before you. We ask you to forgive us for all of our sins. We thank you for your precious gift of your son who gave his life for ours. Or we ask you to forgive us of all of our sins. Heal us, Lord, from the inside out. Please give to us a future and a blessed hope. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord. May we be the place that you reside and change us. Change our heart, O oh God, as David prayed. Renew a right spirit in us. May goodness and mercy follow us all the days of our life. And may we dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We will close in worship. So uh, if you'd like to stand, you're welcome to stand. And I want you to read ahead for next week to Revel uh, the book of Isaiah chapter 25 and 26. So it's, uh, you'll be very blessed by it. So.